So welcome everyone uh, on behalf of United Religion Initiative Europe. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all on the webinar titled Freedom of Religion or Belief, Theory and Practice uh, that will be held by our two dear colleagues. Amina Ferdiak that is coming from Youth for Peace CC from Bosnia and Herzegovina and Eric who is our Global Council trustee on behalf of ERI Europe. And I hope that I think that he's joining us from France right now. If I'm, if I didn't uh, get your location since you are traveling. Belgium. Around. Belgium. Okay. Oh, I already make mistake. Uh, so we, uh, we organize and we decide to organize the webinar on this important topic on the occasion of the, of the International Day of Peace. As probably all of you know, International Day of Peace is marked on the 21st September each year, so this Wednesday. But since there will be a lot of other activities happening on that day, we wanted to start this Peace Week with this webinar and this important topic. Um, so it's great to see some of the familiar faces and some new ones. I want to invite all of you to use chat options so that you can post any question or comments and also feel free to introduce yourself, share your contact details or whatever you think it's, it's important for you to share with them other colleagues on the call. As I said, there should be some more colleagues joining later on, so we will welcome them uh, later. And uh, yeah, I just want them to shortly explain how the webinar would look like. And for those of you who are new, just to shortly introduce uh, URI. So URI stands for United Religion Initiative. It's one of the biggest grassroots interfaith organizations in the world who are working for the peace, justice, and healing. And that is the reason why International Day of Peace is so important for us. And they are some people from URI community and CC present over there, but also some new faces. So I will share some more details in the chat so that you can explore more about URI to learn about this great big movement that is making a lot of positive changes in the world and maybe you can consider for yourself if you would like to join and become part of our family. Uh, the, this webinar is structured on the way that first we will have pleasure to hear from Amina who will share some more about theoretical background about the topic of the freedom of religion or belief and then she will be followed up by Eric who will share his experience, practical one, dealing with this topic. And then in the end of the webinar, we will have some time for the question and answers. But in the meanwhile, of course, as I said, you are invited to use chat option to post any question or comments. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to ask our dear colleague Amina to start. And I will just shortly introduce you, introduce her and share more information about her huge and impressive biography in the chat option. So Amina is coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. She's part of Youth for Peace CC, but Youth for Peace is also one of the biggest uh, youth-led organization working in the field of peace building in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She has background in interfaith dialogue, and of course, she's also expert in freedom of religion or belief, and she is affiliated with the organization like United Religion Initiative, Religion for Peace, and also European Interfaith Youth Network, of Religion for Peace, which is together with URI Europe and Youth for Peace CC, one of the co-organizers of today went. As I said, more information will be shared in the chat and the Mina floor is yours. Thank you, Leila, and thank you for these kind words. And um, I wouldn't exaggerate and call myself an expert in anything, but thank you for, for that. Um, so before we start, I will uh, share my screen because I prepared like a, a small presentation just to have it as a visual uh, besides me speaking. Uh, and I do hope that I will have your cooperation in, in talking to me as well because I don't want to talk all the time. Uh, so as Leila said, um, we are going to speak about freedom of religion or belief and we are going to speak about theory and practice. I will be speaking more about theoretical background and theoretical part of what is freedom of religion or belief with uh, just brief uh, examples of some case studies and Eric then will take over and share more of his, uh, I would say, rich experience and long lasting experience and working in this field. Um, so before we start, um, I would like to ask all of you a question and you can use either chat or unmute yourself. 
So how would you describe freedom of religion or belief? Like what, what, does come, what does it come to your mind when you hear this concept, freedom of religion or belief? As I said, you can use the chat or you can just unmute and you know, give your answers. I'm not asking for a definition. I'm just asking for what do you think about this concept and what it could be? Okay, anyone? I think there is something in chat. Okay, Freedom to Meet by Jean-Francois. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Anyone else? Anything what comes to your mind when you hear this concept, freedom of religion or belief? Yes, this is Robert from the Church of Scientology in Amsterdam. Yes, please. Um, I think it's uh, freedom to freely express your religion is very important to show it and to uh, freely show it and not feel that you have to withhold yourself. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. Okay, I'm also seeing answers from uh, Beth, freedom to have your religion and practice it. Morgana, it also embodies the freedom to choose. Uh, from Carola, to have respect for each other's beliefs and to work together in dialogue on matters of importance. Thank you for these answers. Anyone else who would like just to unmute and, and share where, where we could proceed? Okay, I think there's more in chat. Freedom to hold a belief, not to hold any or to change one. Thank you, Amina. Thank you also for bringing this um, let's say concept and bringing this part of freedom of religion or belief to the table. Okay, if you have any other things, anything you would like to share, please feel, uh, feel free to use the chat. So I will just now proceed, uh, proceed on and share with you my next slide. And uh, here I will share this like very basic conception, the concept about a freedom of religion or belief uh, which is say, to say that this is universal human right, which is enshrined in first universal declaration on human rights, then international comment on civil and political rights, but also in other documents like European Convention on Human Rights. And in most of the countries, it is prescribed by separate laws, which are again, relying on either in universal Decla declaration or different conventions in different parts of the world. So uh, not every country has it, not every country ratified these uh, uh, covenants. For example, the international covenant is ratified by 173 countries uh, and uh, 25 countries did not uh, ratify it. Uh, six of them actually signed, but never ratified it. And uh, 15 of them never signed or not are not parties or anything like that. So uh, let's say freedom of religion or belief, it's probably not enshrined in their uh, constitution or the laws that are regulated uh, this in, in, in these countries. Uh, I have another question for you, which should come now, uh, which is, is freedom of religion or belief absolute right? Do you think this is one of the absolute rights or it's not absolute right? You can either use the chat or you can also unmute yourself and say yes or no. So do we see this concept as an absolute right? Okay. Beth says, yes, the same as Jean-Francois. Viv Bernard again says, yes. We have three yes, that's an absolute right. Another answer in chat, okay. This is just to greet and said peace and blessings. Anyone else? Like, why would you say it is right? It is uh, absolute or why would you say it's not? I have a question, actually. Yes, please, go. What is meant by an absolute right? What is meant by an absolute right? Well, it means that it cannot be breached or that it cannot be, you know, uh, somehow restricted by any means or in any occasions. That means, like, th that would mean that, like, nobody can, uh, you know, breach it or, or uh, restrict it under any kind of conditions. That would mean it's an absolute right. Yeah, yeah, then I agree it's an absolute right as long as people behave while expressing it. Okay, 
So Morgana says no. Thank you very much for Robert. Morgana says no because the religious authorities may curb one's freedom. Eric says it's not. Uh, Carola says individually yes, but not to use religion as a, as a means to enslave another. Okay. So I will give you an answer a bit later on after we go through these articles. Uh, or is there somebody who wants to say something? It seems that I heard uh, someone or, or not. Okay, so we will come to the answer to this uh, to this question uh, as soon as um, we go through these uh, different articles, uh, um, articles that are enshrined, as I said, in uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, International Convent on Civil and Political Rights, and European Convention on Human Rights. I'm mostly using and citing also European documents because. I'm somehow embedded in the European context, and this is the context that I know the best. But if there are any other contexts that you could bring here, I would appreciate that as well. So basically, uh, this is the very, very, very basic right, which is enshrined in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And it says that everyone has the right to freedom. Okay, I think somebody didn't mute or herself, so I would kindly ask all of us just to mute ourselves in order to avoid any kind of background noise. So it says that everyone has a right to freedom of thought, conscious and religion, and this right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, in practice, in worship and observance. So this is, let's say, the basic with which we started. But after the declaration, we have International Convent on Civil and Political Rights, which somehow explains this uh, right in, in a bit deeper mode, in a bit deeper approach. So the first, uh, let's say, part of this uh, Article 18, again, of the International ICCPR, uh, is the same as in the Inter uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But then we have three other uh, parts which are explaining this in more depth. So no one shall be subject to coercion, which would impair his freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. The third one, freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect public safety, order, health or morals, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. So now we speak also about limitations. So in the International Universal Declaration, we only spoke about the freedom and the right to have uh, freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. We can do it either privately or either in, uh, publicly or in congregation. But now we also speak about limitations of, of uh, this freedom. Um, but only a part of this freedom, not the whole freedom, but we will come to that later on. And the state parties to the present covenant undertake to have respect for the liberty of parents. Now we have the parents and the children as well, because this is also very important when we speak about freedom of religion or belief, uh, when we speak about the children and who has the right uh, to regulate their freedom of religion or belief as well. So the state parties to the present covenant undertake to have respect for their liberty and parents and when applicable legal guardians to ensure the religious and moral education of their children in conformity with their own convictions. And later on, I will share with you one example from the USA, which you will see also uh, connected to children and uh, their right uh, and the, their parents' rights to freedom of religion or belief. And finally, I'm sharing with you European Convention on Human Rights. This is Article 9. Uh, the first part is also pretty much similar to the part uh, of the uh, Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the second part uh, is dealing with these limitations, which as again, uh, as said international in ICCPR are prescribed either by law or are necessary. Uh, we have here another uh, addition, which is not in the ICCPR. This is democratic society. So in European Convention of Human Rights, we have this addition that are necessary in a democratic society in the interest of public safety, protection of public order, health or morals, or the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. So these are these legal bases, let's say that uh, we have as legal frameworks to protect freedom of religion or belief. 
either in, on international level, either on the European level. And then again, as I said, like uh, in many countries, there are then separate laws that are upholding uh, the European Convention or uh, other um, declaration and conventions, but also it is worth mentioning that declarations are not legally binding, but conventions are legally binding. So those uh, countries that signed and ratified either ICCPR, either European Convention on Human Rights, they are legally binding to respect them and you know they need to also um, somehow adjust and uh, their laws and their uh, uh, you know uh, mechanisms how to implement these laws with these uh, conventions and uh, these uh, comments. Uh, so the answer to the question is part of the uh, of this uh, of this right is absolute, but part of it it's not absolute. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And this section is known as the internal freedom of religion or belief, and this is absolute. So, you know, any kind of derogation or restriction of the internal dimension is permitted under any circumstances. So this is absolute, and no one, you know, can take away your right to have certain religion or limit it. Uh, this kind of right to have certain religion or not have the religion or not uh, believe in anything or, or uh, let's say hold any kind of beliefs. But the part where everyone has the right to manifest his or her religion or belief in worship, observance, practice and teaching is something that can be subject to the limitations as we also could see in the um, ICCPR and European Convention of Human Rights. So this section is known as the external freedom of religion or belief, and it's not absolute. It is so-called qualified right and might be subject to restrictions. So we also saw certain kind of restrictions that are prescribed by the uh, ICCPR or European Convention of Human Rights. So here I'm just trying, you know, somehow to summarize and list what is meant by the protection and why this uh, right. So the freedom to change religion or belief, this is also like to have the, the religion or a certain religion or belief, but also the freedom to change it. The freedom to exercise religion or belief publicly or privately, you can do it alone or with others. The freedom to exercise religion or belief in worship, teaching, practice and observance. Also the right to have no religion, as Amina uh, also wrote in the chat. So to have no religious beliefs uh, protected, to be atheist or agnostic, this is also a part of freedom of religion or belief. So this is not exclusively reserved for people who are uh, belonging to certain religions or certain uh, religious groups. This is also uh, right for those people who are not holding any kinds of beliefs uh, related to religion or who are atheists, who are agnostic, but also to have their non-religious beliefs protected. Also, it's important to understand that freedom of religion does not prevent, uh, you know, uh, existence of state approved religious institutions. But one, one cannot be forced to join these kind of institutions or to be involved in its activities or pay taxes to it. So this is, let's say, the protection and what, what, uh, what can be covered by this uh, uh, right. But also there are probably other, other things that could be listed here. So the limitations of, the, of this right, uh, you know, it, as, we, as we could see in these ICCPR and uh, European Convention of Human Rights, the freedom to manifest a religion or belief can be limited so long as that limitation is set out in law. So certain countries also are setting certain, let's say, limitations that could be put on religion or belief. This could be sometimes ambiguous because maybe uh, these things uh, can actually somehow uh, interfere with freedom of religion or belief and can be like too much. Um, also, uh, when it is necessary and appropriate um, and pursues a legitimate aim, uh, when wants to protect interest of public safety, uh, the protection of public order, health or morals, but also the protection of others' rights and freedoms. Uh, whenever I speak to people about this part and whenever I try to, to, co to co co comprehend this, for me, it's, it's a bit ambig ambiguous, you know, how this can be a bit abused. And it probably it's abused in certain parts of the world uh, in order to protect public order, uh, order, health or morals. But also it is important to understand that this also depends on the cultural, historical and, and social context uh, where uh, freedom of religion or belief is uh, implemented, uh, which we will also see in, in, in these cases that I will just uh, briefly mention you. So examples of cases. Uh, I'm just presenting now example from the USA 
which is about uh, state of Wisconsin versus Jonas Yoder. Uh, this is the case in which the United States Supreme Court found that Amish children could not be placed under compulsory education past eighth grade. The parents' fundamental, fundamental right to freedom of religion was determined to outweigh the state's interest in edu educating their children. So three separate families, uh, they wanted to withdraw their, uh, their children from the uh, public education school after they graduated from their eighth grade. So they didn't want to let them to go to the uh, two additional uh, grades in public school. Uh, and the state of Wisconsin uh, sued them and they wanted to find them with a with very symbolic fine, but still they wanted to find them and they wanted to coerce them to send their children to, to school. Uh, but the Supreme Court found that this is a part of Amish uh, uh, beliefs, part of their religion, which is based on Bible, which is based also on their um, on their teachings. And it decided that this uh, freedom of religion was determined and it was outweighed the state's interest in educating their children. Um, only one judge had opposing opinion and only one judge uh, uh, wanted uh, to uh, have reverse a verdict saying that the children should go to school and this uh, parents' fundamental right to freedom of religion uh, is not outweighing the, the state's interest in educating their children. Uh, at the back of the presentation, you have all the references so you can read more about this, uh, this verdict. And this verdict is very, very often cited um, and used also for homeschooling cases when, uh, when parents want to homeschool their children. Another verdict is uh, from the European soil. It's um, SAS versus France. And this was a case brought for the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which ruled that the French ban on face covering did not violate European Convention on Human Rights, provisions on right to privacy or freedom of religion or other involved provisions. But this lady actually, um, uh, uh, sued France because there is a Muslim lady uh, uh, of Pakistani origin who lived in France and who was wearing a whale uh, and she sued France the day after this uh, ban was uh, in, in power uh, in front of the ECHR. Uh, and the court actually made a verdict, a verdict that uh, the, the 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 friends did not uh, violate um, face uh, did not violate a freedom of religion or belief. Uh, so fifteen votes were for uh, like the friends in favor of France, and two votes were actually um, in favor of the lady. Uh, what uh, France actually as a state uh, and French government uh, took uh, as let's say and invoked. Uh, were the three grounds for limiting uh, the right to wear uh, the, the right to wear like face covering? Uh, they said respect for equality between men and women, respect for human dignity, and respect for the minimum requirements of life in society. So the uh, the court did not find the French government's position that the ban had, was valid to the gender equality or human uh, dignity concerns, but they accepted France's claim that the ban was necessary for living together harmoniously and was within the law. So also this verdict in, uh, underlined that the states had a wide margin of appreciation in cases like this. So uh, you see how this is embedded in the in the French. Uh, uh, you know, French, uh, these principles of also laicite and the principles of living together in harmonious in society. And, uh, you know, because they also uh, were uh, uh, advocating and saying that uh, the face covering is somehow uh, preventing people for socializing, talking to each other and actually living together in harmony. Uh, so in this case, actually, uh, the verdict was in favor of friends. But of course, uh, I would expect any kind of, if you have any kind of comments and if you would want to say something on this or any other verdicts later on. Um, and um, the, the third uh, example that I want to present to you is uh, Leila Shahin versus Turkey. Uh, this was in 2004, and it was a European Court of Human Rights case brought against uh, Turkey. Uh, Leila Shahin was a medical student, and she was challenging Turkish law, which bans wearing the Islamic headscarf at universities and other educational and state institutions. So uh, in this verdict uh, as well, the court upheld Turkish law by 16 votes to one. Only one person uh, was in favor of uh, Leila Shahin uh, and her uh, uh, her case against Turkey. 
uh, so uh, they found actually that her, uh, let's say, religious freedom had been restricted. But I also found that the restrictions were proportionate to the aims of the university and the state in their attempts to protect uh, states and nations secularism. So uh, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights actually ruled in favor of Turkey because they found that the actions of the university were in accordance with the Turkish law. And also uh, they held that the restriction of religious freedoms in the form of religious attire, which was uh, the, the hijab, was proportionate to the aim of promoting democracy through the maintenance of secularism. So again, this verdict was in favor of the, of the uh, state and 16 votes were for it and one vote were, was for Leila Shahin. So these are the three examples that, that I just wanted briefly to, uh, to show to you. But I want to present you another, let's say, dimension of freedom of religion or belief. I don't want to speak only about the restrictions that could be imposed by the government or uh, the legal framework. I want to uh, just briefly mention social hostilities dimension. So having legal framework and tools is very important, which we have in these uh, international conventions and declarations and in the national laws. But I also want to say that using these is very important because very often we have a lot of uh, tools and a lot of mechanisms, but we don't use them. But working on Ford for all is equally important. So working on reducing social facilities towards and between different religious and wrong religious groups is very important. This means that, uh, yes, government restrictions can uh, breed somebody's freedom of religion or belief. Government restrictions can put certain minority groups uh, into uh, uh, um, subordinate positions. But it's not only government restrictions, it's also the way how society treats certain groups. And it's also uh, the, uh, you know, the, the thing uh, of violence against these groups by the, the majority groups or uh, the, you know, uh, these, uh, this dimension says that uh, um, also like private individuals, organization or social groups can actually, uh, you know, breed someone's uh, freedom of religion or belief by acts of violence and intimidation. And these acts can, and social hostilities can include communal violence against certain groups, but also it can, um, let's say, um, include also religion related, related terrorism, but these social hostilities can be also in the form of verbal abuse. It doesn't have to be uh, physical violence. It can also be verbal abuse and can be, uh, you know, non-acceptance and, and exclusion and marginal, marginalization of certain groups uh, from the society. So this dimension of form is also very important for us working on the grassroots levels uh, and working on the, on the freedom of religion or belief. So I also um, very much uh, would like to, uh, recommend you to check out uh, Pew Forum Social Hostilities Index, uh, where they measure concrete hostile actions that effectively hinder the religious activities of the targeted individual, individuals or groups. So this can also provide you, this index can provide you like very good overview of the situation in the world, what's happening when it comes to social hostilities in certain countries. But they are also trying to measure, you know, uh, to see, uh, uh, if, for example, if there are high uh, restrictions by the government, are the social hostilities like uh, lower or they are higher, or do social hostilities somehow, um, in, uh, somehow let's say, uh, affect that governments are putting higher restrictions as well uh, on certain groups and minorities. So this is very in interesting uh, index that I definitely recommend you to check out uh, on the Pew, uh, Pew Research uh, Center uh, page. And uh, important to remember, uh, at least from my side of view and from somebody who works on the grassroots levels, is that when working on the FORB interfaith approach needs to be uh, taken into account, and we need to work on FORB for all. Since FORB is a right for everyone, it cannot be exclusive for some groups or to favor majority religions. And it cannot be taken as partial and reserved for certain people and religious groups. So when we work on FORB, when we advocate for FORB, it's not about advocating only for our group, for our religion, for our uh, social group that holds certain kinds of beliefs or, um, or, or non-religious beliefs. It's important that we advocate for all because uh, this is the way how, how FORB should work. And I want to also mention the intersection of gender and FORB. This is very important to understand that women 
tend to be more exposed to breaches of form and they are more vulnerable. And this includes uh, already mentioned work and hijab bans. It includes forced marriages, uh, the cases of divorce when women want to divorce in, in certain religions. It's not, it's not always easy to divorce as a, as a woman. Custody of children, honor killings, forced sterilization, etc. These are all uh, the cases where women are much more vulnerable to certain freedom of religion or belief uh, bre uh, breaches. Uh, so uh, I think I will stop here because I talked quite a lot uh, and um, I will hand over to Leila and Leila will hand over to Eric and later on we will have time, of course, for some questions. And uh, this is just to show you that this is the bibliography. So I will send the presentation to Leila so she might share it with you so you can uh, delve deeper into things that I was talking about. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amina. You received some virtual applause for your presentation and a lot of nice comments in chat. I also want to use this opportunity to welcome other colleagues to join us in the meanwhile. So welcome everyone, please use chat option to introduce yourself and for all of you also use chat option to make any question and comments. Thank you very much, Amina, for making this theoretical introduction that we all needed and it is always important to remember when we are talking about some topic what does it really mean and entails and all other things and now we are moving to the second part of the webinar which we call theory and practice so eric will provide us some more let's say practical background from his own experience and i will just shortly introduce himself and then you will once again be able to find his full biography in the chat option so eric is currently president of the european interreligious forum for religious freedom and he's also vice president of the European Office of the Church of Scientology for Public Affairs and Religion Freedom. And we are very proud to have Eric as a URI Global Council Trustees on behalf of the Europe. He was just elected and started in his term in September. So it is great to see this collaboration between CCs and our trustees. So Eric, floor is yours. If you would like to share presentation or just share your rich knowledge about the topic, we are looking forward to listen to you. Thank you, Leila. Uh, well, um, let's organize um, Emina. So I, I don't have any PowerPoint, so you will have to listen to me and be um, maybe it will ask for more attention. But anyway, the first thing I would like to say is um, to emphasize what Emina just said about uh, freedom of religion or belief is for all. Actually, if it's not for all, it does not exist. Uh, it's a universal right, meaning that you have many countries, unfortunately, that pretend to respect freedom of religion or belief, when actually they don't. And what do they say? They say, look, we have here this religious group, this religious group, this religious group, and they live in peace, and they can do whatever they want, and we help them. And then you look a bit further, and you see that it's true, but many other religious group which do not have the favor of that particular country's government cannot live freely. And I can give you some examples. I, I've worked with Russia, for example, and they were coming with delegation of groups that were perfectly free of practicing their religion, while other were completely discriminated against. And they were all saying there is freedom of religion because I have freedom of religion. If I'm a Christian and I say I can practice, and so I have freedom of religion. But in terms of a country, if a Muslim beside me cannot practice, then there is no freedom of religion in that country. So basically, we could say that around the world, I don't know any country which is perfect. Uh, of course, there are much better countries than others or much worse than others. But it's, it's very, I think it's very difficult to reach a point where a, a government or a country is completely fair and fairly treating people and, and respecting freedom of religion or belief for all. But you can progress and you can go into a better uh, position. And that works, meaning that there are things to do that can enhance uh, countries as regards freedom of religion or belief. But to, to achieve something in that field, 
you should not think that it is easy and that it's enough just to go to court and to win. Why? First, because as, as you may see, courts may go, uh, may have several interpretations of what is a religion or belief. Uh, the cases that have been shown by Emina, let's take, for example, the, the case on the, on the, on the veil uh, of the Turkish uh, lady, uh, not the full veil, but the hijab. Uh, the, you have so the European Court of Human Rights, which says that Turkey, even if it violated um, freedom of religion or belief of the lady, they were until, uh, they, they could do so because of the restrictions that we have seen. But the committee, which is in charge of the international covenant on on uh, public uh, on uh, political rights in, in the UN. Um, has decided in a case against France that the fact that they were uh, preventing Sikhs to have uh, their turbans in school was violating freedom of religion or belief and should not occur. So the, the court and the committee do not have the same interpretation of the same rules, finally. So that's obviously not enough. But more than this, many of the politicians I have no clue about what you have clue about. Everything that Emina said, we should think that any politician in the world is aware of this, is aware that there is freedom of religion and that the restrictions must be very limited to something necessary that cannot be done orderly, you know, all, all these rules. But in fact, when you practice meeting with these people, there is a great illiteracy about what is freedom of religion. They do not know. So if you think that you are coming somewhere and say, well, you should respect freedom of religion or belief, it's not true. You must do much more than this. You, you need to understand that the people in front of you do not, do not know what it is. So let's say, let's give some examples. Uh, when you work on a specific case, you need first to ally with as many people possible. Why? Because alone, you will be considered uh, weak. If you come with 20 NGOs, different NGOs, then they will start thinking, oh, we have something here, we should listen. And something else, you should not defend your own religion you should ask somebody else to defend your own religion and you should defend the religion of others. And, and this is strategic. Of course, you should defend your own religion too. I'm not saying it should not be done, but strategically, it's much better if the person defending somebody is not from that religion than if it's only for you, because it shows that other, you know, that it's not just a personal thing, but that there is some pressure, external pressure. So when you come with 20 different NGO from different religions, on one specific case, you start having more power. Uh, but then that's not enough. So what, what we do is, for example, I, I am the chair of a round table called the Freedom of Religion or Belief Round Table, uh, which is based in Brussels. And this round table is uh, an open space where many people can come and participate. It's fully inclusive, whatever religion you are, or if you have no religion. And some of the members or, or the participants, because there is no members, will propose some initiative. And they will say, for example, let's help the Ahmadis in Pakistan. And they will propose a letter. The letter will be addressed uh, either to the prime minister of Pakistan or either to the uh, a member of the European Parliament to ask them for help or whatever, and they propose a letter, and some of the participants will decide that they want to join the initiative, and they will sign the letter. And instead of having one person signing the letter, which will go to the member of the European Parliament, you will have like 20, 30, 40 uh, religious group or non-religious group that will sign the letter and ask uh, for something to be done about it. So it will be received more uh, with more power. And it's not enough. Then after the letter, you need to go and meet with the people. For example, 
who have reacted, who have said, oh, interesting, thank you for your letter. So you go and you meet with them and you see what they could do. And you will organize that, let's say in that example, the European Parliament will write a letter and uh, in favor of protecting the right of the Ahmadis. And that would not be enough. You should have a working group which is going to try to meet with maybe the, the Pakistanis ambassador and try to have dialogue with him and see what can be done. And um, so that's one example of something that could be done. I will give you another example about China. Uh, at one point, a few years ago, there was a, a group uh, of people, it was a, like a Christian group, um, and they were persecuted um, in China, heavily persecuted. And where they, when they came to Europe, because some of them flew China, you know, they, they, they had to escape, so they came to Europe, and they were trying to get the refugee status. Unfortunately, the only data that there was on this group that nobody in Europe knew, you know, were coming from whom? From the Chinese government and Communist Party. So when they were meeting with the authorities in charge of giving or not giving the status of refugees, the only data that these authorities had were the one of the Communist Party from China. So they were first of course, they were depicted as big criminals, you know. And the other thing is there was a lot of false data in what they had. So it was a real problem because first of all, the, the agent of the authorities had a, had a prejudice against these people. But secondly, when they were asking questions to them, uh, they were asking the wrong questions. Specific example, the, the, the Chinese authorities were saying that they were believing in the end of the world. That was not true. So when uh, uh, the authorities were asking, do you believe in the end of the world? The person was saying no. And when it was compared to what was written, the authorities decided that this person did not know very well the religion. So it, uh, we, we think that actually she is trying to use this to get the refugee status, but she is lying. You see where it goes. So, so finally, they were denied in all Europe the right to be refugees. But the problem is that when they were sent back to China, they disappeared, dozens of them. And, uh, and so what we have done, we have worked a lot on this specific case. We started by having scholars working on what was this movement? What did they believe in too? Why was it false, the accusations against them by the Chinese government and gather evidences? It took maybe one year to publish white papers, scholarly papers and everything. And we sent it to all the authorities in charge of giving refugee status in Europe. And, you know, uh, one step after the other, the, the good data started to be in the files. And so they could go and give their story and the people could see, okay, first, this group is really persecuted because that was also a question, you know, but, and, and now when they tell me that they don't believe in, um, in the end of the world, I see it's true, you know, and other, of course, this was not the only thing. There was a, a lot of other things. So they started to get some refugee status. They started to get some good decisions in Italy, some in France, and, and step by step, the situation has been better. But it's just a start because of course, what should be done is how could we change the situation in China? China is maybe not the best example because uh, it looks like it will be difficult to change it, you know, but we should always keep in mind that this needs to change. It's not okay that uh, freedom of religion is not a respected right. Now with that terrible example, you could think that, well, uh, you know, let's say in Europe, we are very in a very good position, you know, we should not complain. Well, it's not true because first of all, something does not stay the same forever. Either it goes in the right direction, either it goes in the wrong direction. And if you don't act at once when there is a violation of freedom of religion or belief, then 
it will go for the world. So, so I think that even in Europe, we have problems. And the problems in the world, you can separate them. Uh, I would give an example of separation, which will be the low level of the problem of freedom of religion or belief is stigmatization. Your religion is stigmatized and you, as a believer of a specific religion, you are stigmatized. Then you have discrimination. Discrimination is whatever is done that you don't have the same rights as others. Or you have a job and uh, you lose your job because you have a specific religion or specific spiritual tradition, or in some countries because you are an atheist and you cannot have the same jobs as others. That exists also in Europe. And then I, I would say the higher level is persecution. Persecution goes from systematic discrimination to killing. And in some countries, unfortunately, you still can be killed for your faith. And, um, and all of this may be depressing because when you start knowing the situation in the, in the world, you see that we are far, far, far from a world with freedom of religion or belief, uh, where freedom of religion or belief is respected. And, uh, but anyway, it, it's, it depends on how many of us are working on it. And because I tell you, having success is possible. I've been, as a round table I talked to you about um, is a sister round table of the one which is in Washington called the IRF round table, International Religious Freedom Round Table. And for example, they have worked a lot with some countries uh, like Kazakhstan, where there was big problems. And finally, Kazakhstan is starting working into a more free country. And they accepted the critics. They accepted to meet with uh, activists uh, of freedom of religion and belief. And they started coming back because actually at, at one point it got worse. So they started coming back to something more reasonable and they want to improve themselves. And I hope it will go to some product. So you have what countries that we thought were bad countries, you know, but even them, they can, you have good people in every country, you know, and, uh, and these people, they can change, they can change their country and we can make progress. Uh, in Europe, I have worked on several issue, legal issue, uh, not legal in terms of court problems, but in terms of legislation, you know, like countries wanting to go to restrict freedom of allegiance in their legislation. It's often justified by national security issues, you know, uh, but you will, you will, uh, if you have noticed in the presentation of Emina, national security is not a reason for limitation. It's not. And a government would, would try to use that uh, to, to make a legislation against uh, freedom of religion or belief is erring. It's never, it, and it will never be. And there is a reason for that, is you can put everything you want in national security. You know, you can decide that uh, in a country that Christians are a threat to national security because the nation is Muslim. Or, or the opposite, you know, you can decide that the Muslim are a threat to national security because we are a Christian nation, but it does not work, you know, or a, a anything. So, so basically, I, we have worked together as groups on uh, legislative initiatives that would have restricted tremendously freedom of religion or belief in Europe. And honestly, at most of the time, we managed to... Uh, to, to deal with it and we managed to avoid this legislation to come in place. And again, it can only be a group effort. I would have been alone, no way. Someone else would have been alone, no way. But together we could, we, we have all of us, we have contacts somewhere, you know. So one of us is getting that contact, another is getting that contact. Then you ask someone who has some influence to write a letter and someone else to write a letter. I remember one legislation coming at the Council of Europe, which was very bad. And the Council of Europe 
uh, in Strasbourg, the, the member of the Council of Europe, the delegations, they received something like 100 letters from different groups about this specific legislation in, in one month. So when it came to the vote, I mean, everybody was like, we received 100 letters from different groups. There is a problem with this legislation. It's not possible. And after many of these groups went to the Council of Europe, meeting with the members and, and explaining to them why it was dangerous. And this, it was in 2014. The, actually, they, they did not reject the legislation. They transformed it completely. And instead of restricting freedom of religion or belief, the resolution, the final resolution was completely protecting more than ever freedom of religion or belief. And that was an effort group. So these are small examples. And I try to tell you that it's a, it's a question of uh, taking any challenge as a group and working hard with several things, with several, uh, I would say, tactical, um, tactical move uh, that can bring change. And of course, if we would be many more, we could work on many more issues, you know, because one group of person, you cannot tackle the whole world. You have to work one issue after the other. But if we attract people who have knowingness in some regions of the world, you know, knowingness in uh, Middle East, knowingness in Africa, knowingness in all this, and they, and they are more or less experts or Anyway, they have an added value for this. So we could tackle much, many more, um, many more issues. And I think it's good because, because all of us, we want to have freedom of religion. And all of us, if we understand what is freedom of religion, we want others to have freedom of religion because you understand that it does not exist if it's not for everyone. So, so uh, I know many of you maybe had your own issues and they might be ongoing uh, wherever you are in the world. And I would say that I would be pleased uh, to work with any of you on any issues that could be a part of it. Um, a last thing that I would say is, I'm coming back to the comments at the beginning. Uh, somebody, I think it's Carola said uh, that it's respecting other religions and, and, and uh, dealing with things with dialogue. And uh, uh, I mean, I agree that this is very good, but this is not really freedom of religion or belief. Why? Because even if you don't like a group, even if you don't want to speak with that group, you know, I think it's stupid, but what, whatever, it, it, it's your right. But still, you have to respect freedom of religion or belief. You have to respect freedom of religion or belief, even of the people you hate. I mean, if you hate, it's not good for your health, but fine, you know, it's uh, so, so freedom of religion belief is the last rampart. In an ideal world, there would be no problem because we would respect each other. And uh, so we would not even think of violating freedom of religion or, be or belief, but we are not in an ideal world and we need this rampart and pushing it everywhere together as a group and with as I said, many tactical moves for each of the issues that we are facing and we can help each other. Okay, that was my briefing and I think there is plenty of room for questions for me and Emina, no? Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Eric. This was very insightful and important and I hope that you can share more details about your round table, maybe in the chat, like the contact details or the website that you're having, or maybe your own email address, because I think that some of the colleagues on this call will appreciate contacting you. And even though we plan and have aimed to finish this <laughs> webinar in an hour, I think that the topic is very important and we have some people who have some questions to ask. So I see that Ahmed is having his hands up. So Ahmed, do you want to ask some question to either Amina, Eric, or maybe just make some comments on the topic. And thank you for joining. Thank you very much uh, for Amina and Eric, and for you for allowing me to join this. Uh, sorry, it is a little bit challenging to hear you. Do you have maybe some headset or can you speak co closer to your mic? Because it's a little bit hard to hear you. Is it better? Yeah, it seems to be a little bit better, yeah. Better? 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you, Laila, and uh, for allowing me to, uh, to to join this very informative and valuable uh, event. I would like to thank you and to thank Eric and uh, Amina for this very wonderful uh, speeches in different uh, ports. Uh, both of them are very impressive and informative and giving us more knowledge to learn from them. I would like just uh, briefly uh, that to say that uh, um, for Eric, he, he mentioned a very uh, sensitive issue and I respect what he, he, he mentioned boldly and uh, bravely about the challenges we have in our uh, call for freedom of religions. And what we need is um, more uh, amendments in, uh, in, um, in uh, the legislative systems and um, also for women and uh, for respect everybody everywhere and uh, without denying their own practices. So we have to be united as we are in the URI, we are united. And um, that's really uh, amazing to still think and the power of we to do that together because only one person will not change it alone. Personally, I'm in Egypt in this time. I, it's, it's very weird in, in, in uh, that uh, there are a kind of engagement between the uh, Salafists and the radicals with the government, which is the, the, the opposite side from the brotherhood. So uh, they like to have evaluation of power on the ground. At the same time, um, um, I'm happy for the Christians and because I was defending all their rights. I'm a Muslim, but I was defending them all over my life and I had troubles with the governments that don't like me for this because um, I'm always calling that they have the rights for building churches, for maintain, maintaining their churches, for um, freedom of expressions, for equality. Uh, third, the last thing is that, that what shocked me in uh, this period, that the Sufism, which is a very peaceful part of Islam, as in uh, sometimes we name it like, the aristocrat of Islam, of Islam, like how is the, the, the compassion, the mercy down to earth, believing God, being humble, being uh, sacrificing yourself to God and respect everybody, even they have sins. Don't think that you are better than anyone in the world. You are, we are uh, all created by God. So. This is, I mean, like the middest um, way for Islam, but now we have a strange situation uh, in Egypt. It's just an example like uh, Amina and Eric uh, mentioned some of the examples. So we, maybe we can work together for more understanding. And I would like to thank you very much. I'm, I'm very, very sorry if I talk too much. Please forgive me. No problem. Thank you, Ahmed. You, you share some important points here and thank you for joining and being with us. And yes, as Eric pointed out, and you also said just together, we together can make a change and it's important that we do something concrete. So I think that Eric and Amina presentation were in a line of calling us for action and what we all can do. Uh, I know that we are a little bit running out of time and some people already need to leave, but if there are some more comments or questions that you would like to make or something that Amina or Eric would like to share, please use this space to do so. Uh, I know that there were some nice comments on the presentation and that people were thankful for being able to listen to this great presentation in a chat, but if there are some more comments or questions that anyone would like to post, please use this opportunity to do so. Uh, I have a question. Yes, Carola, please. Because for years I've done dialogue with interfaith dialogue mm -hmm. and actually uh, uh, what, you've, what I have found is that the groups that you really want to engage with, like what Eric said, the ones who are 
maybe they're really they're a bit difficult those are the ones who don't come to those things and those are the ones that we do have to reach so does eric or amina have any tips of how we can broach the those people maybe as eric said through who you know it's often i found sometimes i've gone to somewhere and they will accept me maybe not my religion but once they get to know me they will start to talk because they know me so how can we work to this otherwise we're preaching to the converted so to speak all the time we're agreeing with the people who agree with us but the people that we have to reach who may be a violating religious beliefs of others we, we tend not to reach or they're harder to reach so any ideas on that because it really comes up a lot in these dialogues with people yeah um, Carola, can, can you give me a, an example of the kind of people you you speak about just to be sure i understand well so maybe if maybe if we had to, in our women's group we have an amadea uh a woman and then for years she was fine and then she got really into the quran and she really got she started going against women's rights and things like that and then we kind of lost her a little bit because we couldn't reach her because she had yeah gone a little bit further to an extreme we've also worked in groups where maybe the iman of the of the i i don't mean to pick out muslims all the time but i've, I've seen that happen like uh, something happened in turkey and all of a sudden all the turkish mosques stopped working with us or the um we were doing a thing in amsterdam with all different religions and then the um the jews the liberal jews would work with us but not the other jews so and then you get a thing of you get caught in between these things but you want to reach out and you want to work together and it just becomes you get involved in the politics their politics of their of their situation and you want to keep uh, keep open those channels as these people retreat because of things that are happening and it's been very real then yeah you okay okay yeah. I, I understand well I, I, I would tell you that i mean i have seen that many times yeah i can, uh, I can imagine <laughs> and, and honestly the, the first thing is for example in the round table we, we have a different approach because it's not an interface approach it's an approach on focusing on freedom of religion or belief meaning that we do not accept anything that is political if it's not freedom of religion or belief and what we ask for participants is only that they respect freedom of religion or belief for all. They respect Article 18 of the Human Rights Declaration and, and that kind of uh, statements. So when it happens that you know that there is this kind of conflict, you just get back to is there a problem of freedom of religion or belief or not? We don't care about if the government of that country is communist or far right or whatever you know that's not the, the thing we are doing we just want to see if there is a problem so let's say you are criticizing a country because a particular group is um, is um, discriminated against in that country and somebody is more of the majority of that country and he takes it personally you need to cool down and say, look, we are not going after countries, we are not going after governments, we are going for freedom of religion or belief. And if you, you can enjoy in that country freedom of religion or belief, you need to make sure that your friend at the table can enjoy it too, you know? And it can be very difficult and sometimes you lose people. I know that, you know? But as you said, dialogue is important. So you can, most of the time you can manage to get dialogue in. And if you lose someone, you will find somebody else in the same community, which is a bit different and can come. And, and, and you said it, you know, it's a question of contacts. And the more, you know, you need also to create spaces where people 
want to be part of, you know, because, because this is the place where it's important to be. If you are a small group which does not do many things, so people come because they like you and the day they don't like you anymore, they don't come anymore, you know. But if you have created like a, an entity, whatever it is, an organization or not, like the round table is not an organization, you know, and, and this entity is known for being efficient. So they will think I should better be there, you know, because this is a place to be. So we need to work on that kind of things, you know. I mean, uh, you, you can, and then of course, if people want to leave, they leave, you know, but still doing things, having success will bring more people in. And at the end, even like the, the majorities, sometimes it's difficult to get the majorities at the table, you know, because the majorities in your country, they think that they don't need this, that kind of things because everything is fine, you know, but at one point, if you are really efficient and you defend everyone the same way, including majorities, you know, they will come at one point because you will find some common grounds on freedom of religion or belief. We, I have seen that in Brussels, you know, where at the beginning, the majorities were not coming. And then at one point they, they saw it was growing and they decided they should join. And sometimes they joined the meetings. Thank you, Carol, for asking this question and Eric for elaborating on it. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe we can spend extra minute or two if someone has some urgent question or comments to make. Uh, otherwise, as I promised in the chat, uh, Amina will share uh, her presentation with me. So I will send to all of you who participate on the call. There will be also recording of the call available on the YouTube channel that I will share with you as well on the Euro Europe YouTube channel so that you have a chance to share this recording with some other people who may be interested to learn more. And in a chat option beside information from Amina and uh, Eric, you also have Eric email addresses that he kindly share and also a website of the um, forum uh, that. Uh, that he's uh, working on and that he spoke about. Um, so yes, I then, if there is no any other question or comments, I really want to thank you all for deciding to spend this afternoon together with us and to discuss about this important topic. And as Amina and Eric shared, you all need to be aware of these important issues. And there is a lot of people around us that need help and support from our side. And therefore my invitation for you will be since we organized this on the occasion of International Day of Peace to use this week and especially this Wednesday 21st to celebrate this day by promoting freedom of religion or belief and using some of information that you learn from Amina and Eric and maybe do some concrete steps in your community to really welcome everyone one because as Eric said, if it is not accepted by everyone and if everyone is not welcome, welcome and treated equally, then we cannot speak about freedom of religion or belief. So thank you once again, and I'm looking forward to see you on some of the next occasions and maybe to use this opportunity to invite you to join us next week on the 26th uh, of September in the same time, 5 p.m. CEST. We will have Another webinar on the topic flipping the script, which is be which will be on the occasion of the week to act for SDGs, and it will be nice conversation about interfaith work and climate changes and what we all can do to protect our planet Earth. So thank you once again for coming and take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.